This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, X Zone Lures, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good evening and welcome to a late night edition of BTL Bass Talk Live where we're going to talk about bass fishing second BTL of the day. Thank you everyone for jumping on. But we had to fit it in because uh, I guess he called him the man of the hour. Well, one of nine men of the hour. Recent additions to the 2024 Bassmaster Elite Series. And I got to be honest, uh, I didn't think it was going to happen from the beginning. I just, cause I knew how hard it is to qualify, but, uh, he proved everybody really. Yeah. I didn't say prove me wrong. It's Ben Milliken. You did like literally everything. Your goal, you go into the year, you want to win a tournament, make the Bassmaster classic on grand, Lake, finish in the top nine, qualify for the elite series and take your fans along on the journey. And Ben Milliken, thank you for jumping on BTL. You did all three of those things and did them quite well this year. Yeah. Pretty crazy season. Uh, I can't really, believe how it all unfolded but made for a, a good story right uh couldn't couldn't just make it all be rainbows and butterflies the whole way it was such a long journey such a long grind and uh somehow we managed to pull her out of the end there you're already learning the ways of the road uh you've had uh, your kid on the road the wife on the road traveling for the last few now the last last five days basically you have fished a tournament and then you did what every guy does after he wins. You went old school. You went to Disneyland right after qualifying, right? Which I thought was ironic. Cause I mean, that used to be the thing that all the Super Bowl guys did. Right. That's right. Yeah. We, I mean, it, it wasn't like I flew across the country on my private jet and did that. We were 45 minutes from it, but uh, yeah, we, we did go to Disney world for the day. It was awesome. Uh, was that planned like before the tournament? Like, was that the whole plan along or was it like, crap we just did it we're going to freaking disney world i wish i could say it was kind of like a spur of the moment thing but we, we built a couple days and stayed a couple extra days the airbnb because i wanted to uh spend some time with the family afterwards and we we had a pretty good idea we were going to go there all right uh a lot of people on live tonight uh we're going to kind of dive into the season i want to do i want to do a juxtaposition of the year i want to talk about worst decisions best decisions toughest day easiest days i want to kind of dive through it because the cool thing was like i said at the beginning of the year you are uh it's it's interesting so for the last three years i would say there's been one prominent social media influencer that's dove into the opens uh you had you know oliver and i with big bass dreams who went out and said, I'm going to throw a freaking glide bait for eight events and see what happens and credit to him. The guy did it. And I know he had some close calls, but it didn't end up great for him. He had Rob Turkla, Lunkers TV, who came out, did some MPFL stuff, fish some opens, uh, limited success. Like I said, it's not easy out there. And then you come in, but you're a little different. You have a little bit of a tournament background. I had you on before the show. Talk about kind of why at the very beginning of the year, why you decided that 2023 was the year you were going to jump into the opens. Yeah. I I mean, it was a lot of reasons and I've thought more about that, you know, why I did it this year Mm -hmm. as people have kind of, you know, a million people are commenting now. Oh, we we knew you would qualify. We knew you'd you'd make it. It's like, I'm glad you guys did (laughs) because it wasn't, uh, wasn't something that uh, seemed like an achievable feat for a long time, but I mean, it was a lot of things that obviously, I I mean, I jumped in because it it felt like the right time for me. Uh, I loved that they switched to the nine tournament schedule um, because I have no familiarity with the large majority of lakes around the country um, that are on the tournament schedules. And so for me to go fish one division of the opens and have to fish against locals on fisheries that in the past, you know, haven't been great fisheries a lot of times. Uh, for how I like to fish, I felt like, um, didn't make a lot of sense. Um, 
and two, I mean, I, I feel like I'm versatile. I felt like the longer it was, the longer the season, the more points that counted, the, the better chance I'd have to get in. Um, and, and honestly, just like thinking back on it before the season started, I was honestly like a year ago, probably a month before open sign up, I was at a place where I had achieved a lot of what I wanted to achieve around the Nebraska area as far as different places I've traveled, different ways that I've fished and made content. And then I made this big move to Texas two and a half years ago, um, not necessarily just for the bass fishing. Um, it was it was a, a business move a lot for me with Six Sense and Waterland being down here. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I really started focusing so much on the, the bass fishing out of my boat side of things, got way back into tournament fishing. And um, I, I started to really think like something was missing with me as far as the competition side of things. And I, I just felt like, uh, I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but I was making content and fishing in ways and showing people how to fish in ways that had never been documented before with big baits, and forward facing sonar and showing people these things. And it was kind of like I was spinning my wheels. Like, of course, it's amazing to get 20,000, 30,000 views on a video. That's, um, that's great. Uh, and and it's, it's amazing to inspire people to go out and fish and teach people to fish. But I was feeling a little depressed, honestly. And like I had more to offer than to just make videos like hundreds of other people are doing. I felt like I, I could easily make a living doing this for the rest of my life. And I don't like to do things the easy way, um, unfortunately, for me many times um, and for my family. I, I don't like to take the easy route. And I wanted to challenge myself and f- and, and just kind of put it out there and see how it would go. Because I know I, I realize I, I feel like I, I had more to lose than I really even thought of at that point with, you know, my credibility of, um, you know, you tune into an angler on, on YouTube and you see him go catch fish. Well, you know how it is, Matt. Everything's relative. Anyone can go out and catch a fish. Anyone can mm-hmm. go out and catch a giant fish. Anyone can go out and catch um, a fish on a big bait or a specific type of bait. But it doesn't mean anything if it's not like, well, Joe Schmo actually couldn't go do that. And tournaments are the only way to really be a proving ground of that. And so, I mean, it was a lot of things like that, but... I needed to scratch the itch and I just wasn't, I wasn't getting a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment anymore from just simply making YouTube videos and and social media content. I put it all out there. So right off the the bat, as you were preparing for the first event uh, back in March on Eufaula in Alabama, did you know that, I mean, were you feeling that excitement again, the nervous energy? Were you feeling like it was a right decision before you'd even made a single cast? Yeah, I think um, I was feeling the, a lot more nervous energy with that one than any of the other tournaments by a ton. When I got the email as we were like pulling into Alabama uh, with the roster of the, the people fishing the tournament, I, I mean, I don't know that they send out a roster for the tournament. I've never mm-hmm. fished an open before. And I start seeing all these Elite Series guys on it and these uh, incredible locals on it. And I'm just like, I was already like mentally trying to wrap my head around all the incredible anglers in the eq field now we got to fish against these guys like you you have self-doubt of course taking on a a massive new challenge and you have the uh, thought in your head like am i worthy of competing even against these guys because i never have um but yeah absolutely man um it, it settled me down of course getting there getting out spending time behind the graphs doing what i love to do and then like we talked about way back when day one of the tournament show up in my first spot catch a limit in six casts that's a great way to start the season and kind of get the monkey off the back and get the get it going i don't think a lot of people understand the pressure that you were under and you mentioned it a little bit just with the eyeballs that were on you uh with all your followers with all the people who watch your videos i mean there's 230 guys that start this thing out and the the vast majority you know, you got friends and family that are seeing where you are in the standings, but you've got an entire fan base of MFers. And I feel it a little bit with BTL too. Like, I mean, it's like you, you have a a bad one and you're like, damn, like I'm going to hear about that one from, cause there's some people that just love. I wish I was this guy who just had his mom and dad. Yeah. There's some people that just love to see people suck. But I mean, I take that in stride because there's also 
just for every person that loves to see you suck, it seems like there's 10 people that are behind you no matter what. But uh, did you know how much of an impact it would have on your fan base when you started having success in the Opens? Or was that even a surprise as to how many people came along with you on every cast of the journey? I mean, I can't say I really expected it because I didn't think that I would get fifth in the first Open and first yeah. in the second Open. And so it it really was like crazy, the traction at that point with where it was going and again, not being arrogant, but you, at that point, like those, are the first two opens I've ever fished, you mm-hmm. do get like, I, I have so much respect for these anglers and, and who I'm fishing against. I knew they're incredible, but I did think like, it's possible. Like I could win a couple of these things and finish, you know, and get a check every tournament. It's possible at that point. It felt that way. Um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and so I, I, it was amazing to see how many people did get behind it. Of course, you know, just people come out of the woodworks. Everyone's got negative comments, and those those really started to uh, pile up kind of later in the season too. And it's the see, I told you so, is kind of started piling up too. And uh, you know, I'd be lying if I said I didn't read some of the comments. You know, that day one in Florida, I go in and I I, I bust that bag, and I went from seventeenth to tenth, and um, I still had people in the comments. Oh no, it's not possible for him to come back. He's, he's, I'm just and I was just like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> After those first two, uh, and I want—I definitely want to go back to the Toledo Bend because that's where things like you had—you had a string. You win, and then things get real at like Bugs Island, Wheeler, and you fall, and we'll go through some of those grinds. But what was your social media and phone and stuff like after that? Like how many, how many DMs and messages are we talking about after after the win? A lot. <laughs> like thousands I hundreds i mean is it just trrr? yeah I, I don't know like it was it was kind of the same after i qualified here in florida with yeah. text messages a couple hundred text messages maybe three or four hundred text messages i don't know wow but and then way more comments and stuff but yeah it was it was full-on like insanity you know you go on talk to dave mercer and he's got a nickname for me the next big thing in bass fishing which i'm just like whoa pump the brakes on that dave but just i mean even like looking back on that i felt so stupid like after freaking you know st lawrence river after watts bar and i'm just like okay i'm 23rd in points in the opens i'm the next big thing in bass fishing according to dave like <laughs> Feel like an idiot, that's his but, job though man uh, like his is, job is to do that like he's doing his job to take care of his yeah, of anglers and you're in his I, I angler get i get it it's just like man it's it it seemed like it was in my grasp and it, it all went away and so it yeah i guess we can kind of get more into that but uh, yeah but so here's my question i fished a lot of opens a lot of guys that fish opens there were 50 to 60 guys that were in this field that fished all nine that were flw tour pros former elite series pros bpt guys established guys who have won tournaments you come in like no bs you made it look easy fifth and first uh i could tell you were green because when when you texted me before each day you'd be like yeah i'm catching them no one ever says that i don't care if you're best friend that you're working with you're never like yeah i'm freaking crushing them and then when i say like how good you're like mid-20s I'm like, that just doesn't happen. And I'm like, holy crap, like this, he's really good at ketchup. But did it seem easy in the first two? Were you shocked at, at how easy it was? Or was it a grind? Or was that just, was that a perfect storm that set up the way you like to fish, the way you like to catch him, and the way those fisheries set up for you? Yeah, I mean, it was easy. And <laughs> it, it wasn't necessarily because the way that it's set up for me, it just, I found the fish on side scan and I cranked them and I big baited them and it was awesome. Um, but I mean, I think looking back on the season now after nine tournaments, it was, it was great that it happened right at first, but it didn't, it doesn't matter looking at the points when those, those finishes like that happen, whether they're back to back at the start in the middle at the end of the season, it doesn't matter, but they happened. And um, I made the most of the opportunities I was given because when you're fishing a nine event season and you have to have 18 really solid days in the water, you cannot mm-hmm. slip up. Maybe you can slip up once. Um, you have to do good every day. You have to take every point for what it's worth. You have to take every fish loss and every big fish for what it's worth. And you just keep on grinding because you can't have a bad day. Yeah, as a whole, did you would you say you fished fairly clean throughout the year? 
not as clean as I would have liked to, no, definitely not, but clean enough. I mean, <laughs> we got it done. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty a lot of times. I, I, I mean, were not, you going into the fi the final event going, damn, this fish is going to cost me the freaking elite series. There was a couple things throughout the season that I was, you know, stressed about. And the, I mean, I can't tell you, we'll kind of get into it, but day two was the most stressful everything going wrong day of my entire life at the Harris chain. And when you're, you know, driving five miles idle for 15 minutes, drive three miles idle for 20 minutes on that Harris chain between those, those canals and everything, every single point that you missed is coming back to you. And that's all I could think about, um, which isn't a great mindset I feel like, but um, yeah, there were, there was a lot of fish that I missed and, you know, stuff that happened with co-anglers and, and stuff like that that, um, that that I was thinking about, of course. Let's get into that final day. I'm going to actually pull up the Harris chain. Uh, obviously, probably the most memorable. Well, no, you had a lot of memorable days, but obviously the biggest day of your. Is that the biggest, the most stress you've ever felt launching the boat on the water on day two of the Harris chain? I'm not launching the boat, but from the first time I put the trolling motor down, my first spot on nothing went right and after that point yes i actually what? felt so much stress day two of the toledo bend open um i had to like go pull my boat off and sit by myself and like listen to some some loud music and and, and hang out a little bit to chill myself out because i knew what i was on and what was happening but um yeah once once i felt what was going to happen on this harris chain tournament when you have one of these days where I don't know if everyone has these type of days, but you know that no matter what you do, something is going to give you adversity from all different angles. Like that's what was happening. And I could feel it happening because I have those days filming too. Um, yeah, I was stressed out from the first cast. Okay. So Harris day two, it was on live. A lot of people watched it. Uh, every time I watched it, you were like sitting and waiting for something. <laughs> And, yeah, that's, that's, and that's I, I could not, too, I couldn't like, imagine the stress because uh, in the few situations that I've been, I've been like, oh my gosh, three minutes, that's six casts. What? Uh, and, and you're literally like in a traffic jam trying to get into where you are, knowing you're only going to have a couple hours to fish in there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, I mean, that's the way it was. They had the coverage from 830 to 1130 our time and during that period i mean i fished for i i was probably fishing until nine o'clock didn't catch any and then i began my trek down to uh lake apopka on the south end where i had to do all those idle zones and then i get down to the lock and there's 20 boats waiting in a lock that holds three boats and um it, it wasn't that way the day before it was i was the first one there and uh it at 11 o'clock, I got there at the same exact time or similar time, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. There was no one there for a different reason. Um, and so I was like, uh, what's going on here? So. And the lock was closed on day one or something? Day one, it was closed when everyone that ran there immediately went there. And so they turned around and were gone. I didn't realize oh, you didn't they know closed. That. And so I just showed up at 1030 and there, I had to like pull the thing to wake them up in there to make them open it up for me. And I went right through. Oh, so you had the whole lake to yourself on day one. Um, there was probably a handful of boats still, but yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to add this because I want to show people. Uh, this is a really, this is uh, Google Earth. But for those who don't know, so you've got the Elite Series on the line. You guys take out of uh, Harris. I, it's been a couple of years since I've been there and I didn't go to this one, right? So you take out of yeah. Harris to get to where you're going. Yeah, up on the northwest to... side there of Harris. Up yeah, the Venetian and, Gardens. Yep, over. And then yeah. you have to go through Eustis. Yep, you idle. It's twelve minute idle there from Harris to Eustis. Not that I was counting. Then you go into Eustis, and then from Eustis, do you have to go you into go from Dora? Eustis to Dora. Yep. So that's and fourteen so minutes. That's the. Is that the whole Dora Canal and all that? Yep. Did you see the gnomes? Do they still have the gnomes in the Dora Canal? Yeah. Yeah, there was gnomes. Um, there was everything under the sun. Uh, mostly uh, pontoons going really slow that you couldn't pass. And then you, and go, you, go, you go into Beauclair and you idle at that in between in between Dora and Beauclair over there on the east side there. You're right. Yep. And then you blast and across then you get in. You get into this canal. Yeah, you idle a few times through there. And, and then, then you, you take this canal down. all the way down. And there, this is that 
that lock that you were stuck at is like right in here, right there. It's south of there, I think. That's a bridge. That's a bridge right there. South of there. Nope, south. Right there. Yep, there it is, right there. Yep. Little bitty lock. Tiny. And now you're three lakes away. You're what, 40 minutes in? More than that. It took two hours to get there exactly from launch down to where I was fishing. Yep. And then you go all the way down this whole canal. Then you bust out into Apopka. And then uh and then there's Apopka. So and then that's where you fish. Apopka's been very popular over the past five years. Uh more so, more so, more so. But the chain was fishing a little a little odd this year because of a lot of it was dirty, right? Yeah, it was all dirty pretty much. So then you get in here, you could, and then you have to go back. You have a whole two hours to get back. So on day two, you didn't get down there till what noon, 11, something like that. Yeah. I think I rolled in like 1140 or something. And you had to leave at what time? I ended up leaving at one 30. That's not that much time with a camera, no, with everything on it. And you didn't have anything in the box. Did you? Nope. Zero fish. So what happened on the first port part of day two that made you not go there right away? That's what I want to know. I mean, okay. So uh, day day one, I show up to a spot where I fish. And I, I was the only spot I found that had a group of fish on. It was a school like 20. And they were all like a pound and a half to two and a half pounds. But I was like, cool, I'll start here, catch some. Because it was not easy on the chain anywhere. And uh, the fish in Apopka from practice were biting way better. They'd set up way better on the brush and stuff from like 10, 11 o'clock on. So I was like, I'll go get a limit and then I'll go to Apopka and I'll crush them. And so I start on the first spot and Logan Parks was actually fishing it. Um, he wasn't fishing that. He was fishing a brush pile that was probably, I'd say, 70 yards from me. It was close enough. We could like talk loudly and we could hear each other. But I mean, it was, I was fishing a, a shell bed with a school on the, the side of it. He was fishing a brush pile. If we casted, we probably wouldn't be able to hit the, our lures on the end of a cast. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so we're fishing for a second. Clark Ream rolls in on pad and um, I'll just freaking say it. Uh, it was kind of trash. So me and Logan Parks are fishing for a, a chance to qualify for the elite series. We're both, he's in, I'm, you know, it's day one. You guys are in the exact same position. Basically Correct. you both have to catch him at the Harris chain to make Correct. It. And he's out of it a hundred percent out of it. Um, and so he pulls in and with, with it, like we could have both casted over his boat and I would, he, he mentioned, you know, it's fishing a lot like Wheeler out here. And I was like, all right. And Logan kind of goes off on him a little bit and told him he didn't like it. It was BS. And I crack a three pounder on a Carolina rig and his co-angler and him start casting to where I cast it in there and to where I was casting. And so I told him, you know, GTFO. And, um, and so him and between me and Logan saying it was ridiculous, he rolled out of there. So, uh, I, you know, Logan didn't catch anything on his brush pile. He's fishing out there and he was just fishing one little piece of brush and rolled out of there right after Clark. And I proceeded to catch like 12 keepers there and, you know, probably cold up to like nine pounds, 10 pounds maybe. And so day two, you know, Clark's got a, a better boat number than me. I think he caught four pounds the first day. And when I showed up, he was sitting directly on top of the, the fish I was casting on. And it, I mean, not catching anything or anything like that. So that had me a little frazzled, had some words with him. I didn't think it was probably great that he was there since he was caught four pounds the first day and wasn't in contention for the points. And yeah. So basically I, at the end, by the end of it, I was like, dude, can you just give it to me for like a half an hour and fish it the rest of the day? Cause he said, well, I caught some here in the afternoon. So I decided to start here. And I mean, he caught like four or five pounds. Um, and so he uh he's like yeah i'll give you until 8 45 and then i'll be back here and you can come fish it with me the rest of the day if you want to and i was like all right well, i'm not coming back the rest of the day so you can have it but anyways i fished it till then they were all messed up fish wouldn't set up right they were just bumping my carolina rig wouldn't wouldn't commit to it and you know i i start whipping out spinning rods i start hover strolling them i start drop shot and throw a two eight little swim bait on them and they would, they would bump it. I, I'd catch shorts, just craziness. And, uh, ended up, I was like, I got to get out of here. So I roll out of there with no keepers.
I mean, are you, nine, are you vibrating times. at this point or are yeah. you still chill? Um, two thirds of the way vibrating. Yeah. And you decide let's go run three different lakes and go to Apopka. Yeah. And I, I mean, it was, that was all based on like, I found good stuff from practice. That stuff got beat up. I had fished a couple of it that my best juice spots in, uh, in Eustace and in Beauclair on the way down the first day for like 15 minutes of stop. Didn't get a bite. Um, then there, it was like Beauclair. I show up in practice and I catch a three pounder first spot, like first five minutes of practice, catch three pounder on a shell bar. I was like, I catch and I was like, boop, mark it just kind of like scan the trolling motor like 50 mm-hmm. yards cut and i throw in catch a 10 pounder and like, like one zero hide. what's that one zero ten yeah yeah okay i just made sure i heard that yeah. right i mean i didn't actually weigh it um you'll see on the video i was trying to hide it from the college kids in the tournament in the 200 boat plus college tournament so i just turned the boat and i could have grabbed him but i kind of just let him jump off and uh yeah it was it jumped right next to the boat it was Wow. freaking giant okay. um yeah and so i was like all right this is great and in practice every day there's like 70 boats in beauclair and scanning for like this little tiny lake in this mm-hmm. one piece of whatever that's super easy to find and i figured it got beat up and it did it was done so yeah i didn't have anything else to just stop at or go to really that i had confidence in so yeah i said screw it picked up ran down there and we get almost to the lock and almost to where we can see it and there's all these boats coming back towards me um justin kimmel who i know and, and he's like dude there's 50 boats at the lock turn around and i was like no that's not possible and i had talked to the lock master the day before as some a, a, an older lady she was real cool but she was like yeah it broke down several times today we had to change out all the the fuses on it multiple times and i'm not going to be here tomorrow we got a new guy so if it breaks down it ain't getting fixed i was like oh god so I figured it had broken yeah. or something, but I start and then Brandon McMillan comes back down. So the same thing. And then Brucey was in front of me. He turns around, goes back around and I was like, Oh God, here we go. And so I rolled down there and there was like 18 or 20 boats when I showed up and I was like, is it broken down? What's going on? And they're like, no, no, they're getting them through decently quick. It's just, you know, it, it took seven minutes. It's per what, cycle. three, four, three, four boats at a time. Three boats. Yep. Three boats. Oh, tight. Tiny lock. Yeah. So it's like cut a minute and a half to get in there, minute to shut the door, seven minutes up, minute to open the door, let them all out, close it seven minutes down. So I had to wait for like four cycles. And um, uh, then I finally get through after about an hour and a half. Did it consider, did you consider turning around? I mean, what made you, was it the only thing you had that you felt was your best chance to put five in the box? Yeah, and I figured I could go back to that school maybe and grind out a limit. I had other mm-hmm. stuff I could try, but I thought I could – I thought I probably had to top 10 it, which I didn't end up having to, uh, but I thought I had to top 10 it, and I, I figured I probably needed 13 pounds to top 10 it. Were you aware that Bobby was one spot behind you and was in like 50th and you were in second after the first day? So like you had the one guy you probably don't want trying to chase you down in Florida directly behind you. I had 39 points on him after the first day. Did you and know so, that? I mean, you looked. Oh yeah. Yeah. We all, <laughs> everyone knew we were dude, was doing the math. Well, I mean, you think about it, yeah. especially with the spots I had where I was running. Um, like if I would have had six, seven pounds on that first spot, which was very, very easily done. Um, I would have been qualified. And so I wouldn't have had to run down, but um, yeah, I didn't catch any. And so, you know, you start doing the math in your head and you're like, well, it's good that Bobby was in 50th because he could only move up so far. He wasn't in 127th. Yeah. Um, but as Logan time, Parks was in like a hundred some. It was, he, he had a he big sh- day too. You know, but it, I mean, it's, it's not like when you go into an event where you need to make up that, well, there's double points because I can drop yeah. and he can also gain. So I had to drop, you know, whatever that is 16 uh 18 points and he which could is make easy up 18 to do points which is oh, easy easily. to do and so especially I, in florida it's literally one flip either way like correct you know you ended up finishing in ninth so you had one cushion spot you didn't know that at the time but bobby was one flip away from qualifying a couple of guys were one flip away for qualifying and there's a couple of guys that were in that were one flip away from not qualifying yep correct so i mean i i, I wasn't gonna let the the foot off the pedal. Um, I, I knew I had to, I, I'm not, 
I, I knew I would be kicking myself if I was like, all right, screw it. I'm turning around and going to go fish for five hours for, for small ones and try to catch seven pounds or 10 pounds at most. And we'll see where that gets me. And if I don't get in, like I knew I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't go down there and try it. Cause in what I had down there was not like, Oh, I'll fish around and flip my cricket around and hope I get a limit. It was like, there's 30 fish on one brush pile and 12 of them are over five pounds and it's the deal. So I knew what I had down there. Did you do a bunch of homework before you went down there? Because I know the first time I went down to Florida, I did so much homework and talked to a bunch of people and it still didn't really help because you can get so spread out down there on so many different lakes and you have the Griffin thing and you have the Apopka thing and you literally have like a decision to make it take off. Do you go one way? Do you go the Dora Canal? Do you stay in that? I mean, you, I mean, did you do a lot of extra homework going into that event, that final event? Yeah. I mean, I, I try to all the time. I'm such a nerd and I just, I, I've put <laughs> so much of my time studying and trying to prepare uh, ahead of the, my, my video schedule this year to try to make this happen. Um, but I put so much homework in and like you're saying, man, I had so many people telling me, Oh yeah, your big bait fish are going to be, it's, you're going to crush them on a big bait. Yeah. Go to Beauclair. It has five foot visibility, dude. I put the troll motor in the first day I fished. Harris, Little Harris, Dora, Beauclair, Eustace, and I never saw one foot of visibility on any of them. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to top 10 this one. I'm going to be screwed. But, um, you know, luckily day two, I went down and practiced in Apopka and I got on this brush pile deal and I found this this cool little spot. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I got to yeah. fish there here in a couple months. Um, but, uh, but, um, I caught him there. And so that I caught him good enough that I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to Griffin. I'm scratching Griffin off. And I mean, the lakes aren't that big. Yeah. Really, a pop is huge. It's the biggest one, but it's completely featureless for the most part. And, and so a lot of dead really water small. in it. Yeah. Really, Harris probably fishes the biggest because there's a lot of um, shell and grass and points and ledges and different types of grass. But um, yeah, that that let me kind of be more comfortable with just being like, all right, well, I'm just going to go scan and I'll try to figure something out in uh, Apopka, a different part of the lake for a little bit. But besides that, I need to find a place to, to catch them by the ramp um, on the way out and on the way in and hopefully find a couple of spots on the way in between. I mean, once you put five in the boat, you knew you had it. You knew you're on the, in the elite series. You knew that there was really no way that, I mean, you had Dude. to know on the water when you did it, like, Hey, it's freaking done. I just got to get back now. No way, man. I've caught 20 really? pounds the first day. Yeah, dude. There was a bunch of 17, 16 to 18. You didn't think bags. you didn't think once you put 10, 11 in the boat that you'd have 15 a day and you're like, all right, I don't think there's any way it's going to. Hell no, dude. I, though the problem is like if Bobby would have caught a 23 pound limit, which yeah. I, I mean, it, uh, there was like four guys that would, if they would have caught 20 pounds, they probably would have passed me. And I mean, they didn't, and it was crazy tough. And it, the weights ended up looking more like, you know, um, like Watts bar than they did the, the Florida Lake. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I knew that I did what I could, uh, and I got the weight that I, I could get and would be good enough to, to have my, uh, a chance to make it still. But yeah, dude, I, I mean, I fly in at 4.15 and I have to wait for two and a half hours of weigh-in to figure out what, what's going to happen with the next several years of my life. Uh, I, I know that was cool. So last year uh, when Hallman and John Sokup made it, you know, I waited around with them and it got dark and everybody had left at the weigh-in and they're standing there and there's, you know, 12 guys or 15 guys standing around and they didn't really do an announcement at the time then. Uh, and it's just dark. And then Hank comes out of the trailer. And I mean, I'm I'm sitting there drinking a cold beer like my season's over. I cashed a check. I was happy. I was just there to support them. And I'd already put my boat on the trailer and come back to the way in. And uh, boy, that is a crazy moment when he comes out and he read the names off and you literally see guys faces. And not so much for Hallman because he's been there before, but you see these guys faces and are like, I just achieved something and felt like I went through the gauntlet and did something that is a lifelong dream of mine. It's not that often you get to look someone in the eyes and be around someone who achieved a lifelong dream. I would have to imagine that moment when you 
was official had to have been such validation for what you've done the past year. Yeah, I got goosebumps right now thinking about it. It was pretty crazy. And it, it was actually a really cool, um, you know, to kind of contrast what you're saying. It was a, a cool environment because with day one getting canceled, everyone fished day two, boaters yeah. and co-anglers. And so that meant that the entire crowd of all the families and friends all stuck around. And so it was actually a really big crowd. You know, it was probably the second biggest crowd to Toledo Bend we had all season long that was there. Um, so it, it was a really cool environment. A, a bunch of the fishermen stuck around because they just weighed their fish. It wasn't like it was just the top 10 weighing in. Um, so it, it was it was super cool. And yeah, man, it was I, it still hasn't sunk in um, really what what happened, but it, it will over the next month or so. Uh, anybody surprising reach out afterwards, either in the fishing world or outside of the fishing world, where you're like, holy cow, I didn't even know this guy was paying attention to what was going on. <laughs> Nothing crazy. I mean, I've had, I had, I kind of had that moment a little bit after I wanted to lead a band, a mm -hmm. lot of elite series pros, MLF guys reaching out, um, you know, um, the, everyone from Bass, uh, all the higher ups, um, was super cool. Um, but yeah, man, a bunch of the same people reached out. Um, I've gotten a lot of phone calls from companies in the industry that are like endemic companies that I never thought that I would be um, getting after, you know, the last eight years of, of grinding and, and putting out content that uh, would sell them more product than just making the elite series. But man, I'll take it. Does that surprise you that, uh, I mean, that's been a debate over the last couple of years as to what is, is moving more product. How is tournament success at the highest level moving more product as opposed to the connection that social media and content creators are making selling product? Did it, 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 it surprised you how much the endemic companies still value tournament success? Yeah, a little bit. Um, almost like they didn't know who I was or anything until I qualified, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying anybody should, but I mean, I, I know from experience or in my personal experience that what sells the most product by a landslide, but that's me. All I can speak for is myself. I don't know other guys making videos, but they, they move. But um, yeah, it surprised me a little bit. Huh. I would take a first break of the show. Uh, when we come back, I want to play a game of of best, worst, highest, lowest throughout the entire year. Just ask you some questions and kind of get a better feel for uh, all nine events of the Open that started back in March at Lake Eufaula in Alabama and ended in October on Lake Apopka in the Harris Chain. You good with that, Ben? Let's do it. All right, BTL. Late night BTL with Ben Millick. Is that an old-fashioned? Nah, man. It's straight whiskey. Oh, straight whiskey. Okay. All right. Your whiskey? So, Are you drinking yeah. your own whiskey talking about how you qualify? Oh, that's just savage. <laughs> All right, BTL. On a Wednesday night, we'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. Shoreline Boat and RV, dock rash, storm damage, collision repair, that deep scratch or gouge from trying to access that secret creek. Shoreline Boat and RV can get your prized possession back in mint condition and looking good on the water, fast. 
All repairs are done in-house, so they're able to get your boat or RV back to brand new quickly. All Shoreline's work comes with a rock-solid warranty. Find out more at ShorelineBoatAndRV.com. Kansas City, Austin, and Tulsa. All right, we are back with Bassmaster Elite Series Pro Ben Milliken. I, I honestly did not think I'd be saying that at the end of the year. Like, it would not have surprised me if you won an event just the way that you fish. But just from the start and having fish them, I did not think you'd be able to keep up the consistency just because of the experience factor. The multiple days, the 200 boats. What do you do when you have four fish at 2.30 and you're due in at 3? Like, that was where I thought, like, it didn't surprise me. Like, no no bullshit. It didn't surprise me that you won Toledo Ben and how you won Toledo Ben. What, it, what surprised me, Ben, through the year was the 62nd, the 64th, the 29th, the 93rd, the 83rd, and the 46th that that that's where like every point is a point, but in, that's where the elite series was made. Would you agree with the decisions that were made on those tough tournaments? Because I talked to you several times at the boat dock where you're like, dude, and you can see in the videos that you put out, like there was a lot of last minute fish, a lot of grinding, a lot of, Oh my God, this is not at all how I planned it to go. And that's where a good tournament angler is able to make minor adjustments, to make big adjustments, to come in with the fish in the clutch. And you just didn't have the open level tournament experience to do that. And you performed like a tour veteran, which is what honestly surprised me the most out of your season. I was definitely fortunate throughout the season. I had some really important fish catches that might have only been one and a half pound fish during an 80th place finish or something, you know. Anyway, I know we'll get into that, but yeah, it, I, I made mistakes for sure be, from being green um, to three-day tournaments to 200-plus boat tournaments to tournaments on bodies of water that I wasn't familiar with, which was all of them except for Lake of the Ozarks, and I had never fished there except for during the winter. Um, and so, yeah, man, it was it, it was almost like I. I had I had, like my my St. Lawrence River tournament was my worst tournament of the year, mm -hmm. but I felt like I fished almost like perfectly in that event. As stupid as that sounds, I fished as well in that event as I did when I won at Toledo because of what the fish gave me. I mean, and I, I talked to my travel buddy Brock about this, who's a phenomenal fisherman, best probably the best fisherman in Northeast Nebraska and South Dakota. He wins everything up there he had a terrible year like and i'm not just like picking on him or anything but by his standards and the fisherman that i know he is he's one of the best out there he had a really bad year and then he, when you look at the tournament results it's not necessarily like you finish 93rd that means you're terrible and there's 92 guys better than you it's just what you can make of what you're given i guess is something that it's hard to comprehend until you're actually out there, even on a fishery like the St. Lawrence River, which is the best fishery in the country. Um, yeah, it, it, it was definitely, there was, there was a lot of times that were different than I expected them to be, that I was really able to not give up and to fish as, and maximize as well as I possibly could with the, the fish that were around and the bites I got. All right. Uh, best decision of the year. In the tournament or practice or it just it's overall. I mean, dude, I'm looking at the first cast or first cast of practice from you follow to the last cast of the tournament at the Harris chain. It could be something in there. You look back and say that was the best decision I made the entire year. I can't think of one in particular. Obviously, going to a popka instead of turning around was a big decision that got me in the elite series. And you can see that it got me in the elite series tangibly because it's the last day where points ended up but um i'm trying to think um i think maybe when i fished like my first 10 different areas on the st lawrence river and didn't get a bite uh or a, a keeper bite and i went to a random sand flat way yeah, that, down that was by gonna the bring lake, up way down by the lake that it was like uh, do I want to run 12 more miles to the lake and the freaking waves and the current and I got to get gas then? Or do I want to just try to make them bite down here? And I was like, I can't wait any longer. It's noon, 1231. I didn't have a fish and I got to run 70 miles back. I got to do something. 
And I run down there and I start catching them on the spy bait, on the little fuzzy bait, on freaking stupid little stuff. And then day two, I, I go down there and I caught my whole 17, almost 18 pounds on the same spot around Corey Johnson and Adam Rasmussen and these smallmouth gurus. So that was probably my most important decision in my worst finish of the year. Yeah. Uh, worst decision you made all year. Um, I'm trying to think of a real bad one. Uh, one that stands out, which is a stupid thing is I was, I was fighting a two and a half pounder at Ufala, Oklahoma, and I tried to boat flip and it broke me off on a spinning rod that would have given me another pound and a quarter, which would have given me 30 ish points. Oh yeah. That decision was probably my worst decision of the year. Yeah, those haunt you when it, when they're yeah. your mistake. Like your mistake, like that's the one that I just I like beat the steering wheel on the way home and drive twenty hours straight. When it's a hundred percent on you, everything yeah. performed flawlessly because you could. And it always seems to happen. And then you start question. At least I do. I start questioning my decision making ability. Because I'm like, well, the only reason I did that was because of the stress of the moment, even though I wasn't feeling in it, which means that the stress is causing me to make decisions I normally wouldn't make. Exactly. And it was like one of those where it's like the third fish. At, you didn't catch any, and then you pull up at 10 o'clock. It's the third keeper in a row on that stretch, and you're just like, this is awesome. I'm on them. And I broke it off, and I was like pissed, but I was like, whatever. I'll just freaking catch them. I caught like one keeper the rest of the day for like the next five hours. But um, that's probably my worst decision. I didn't have any where I was like, oh, should I go fish, safe fish mm -hmm. and catch 15 pound limit five miles from the ramp? Or should I run 90 miles and gamble? I didn't really have anything like that where I made a bad decision. Uh, best day on the water all year. Um, best day I f that, I, that I felt the best or that I fished the best? Just in your opinion. I probably fished the best the second day at Toledo Bay, but I felt the best the third day. Okay. <laughs> that makes uh, sense. Yeah. Toughest day on the water all year. Day one at Watts Bar, for sure. Two keepers. Only day I didn't weigh a limit. That was massive to come back and finish 83rd there. Yeah. Because you I had a stack it. on the second day, what, 11, 12 pounds? I caught a four and a half pound small the second day. Is that Huge. what got you in the elites? That one four and a half pound smallie, if you go yeah, back and take that sure. away. Yep. But the, I mean, that's probably the same way with several yeah. fish throughout the year. Yep. When you're when uh, you're the last or second to last person in by 35, 40 points, then it's yeah, yeah. it's gonna be that way. Uh biggest thing you learned all year. Oh man. Um That's tough. Uh, I would say biggest thing I learned was it doesn't matter how good you catch them in practice and not to freak out when you have a terrible practice. Because I went from like having phenomenal practices for a couple tournaments. And then I, I think the, the really set in at Ufala, Oklahoma, where I was like, my season's over. I'm screwed. I haven't caught the first day I caught 14 pounds and I haven't caught seven pounds since then. I am so screwed, but really that doesn't mean anything. You don't get anything for catching them in practice. And I kind of just like rolled that mindset on like whatever, if I had a good day, try to learn from it. And if I have bad days, that means nothing mm -hmm. because it's practice. And for some reason there's five days of practice. Didn't you catch a freak show six at you follow Oklahoma too? Huge. Yeah. I, that was one. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, that was what taught me to think that way because that area was a great area. I caught a four and a half and a six in the same like stretch right there. And I found it and I caught keepers there and I just kept moving on. I didn't like break it down because it was practice. I didn't fish it thoroughly. And it, it really, I mean, it's super like, it's a obvious thing to think like that you're not going to fish that thorough in practice. So obviously you can go back and catch them better in the tournament, but it really made me change my mindset on like, you need to understand in practice, if you catch a keeper or a couple of keepers in an area, it's a good area and it's okay if you suck the rest of the areas in practice, just go mm -hmm. try to find more areas with fish in them 
And then in the tournament, when you start getting that positive feedback, you start getting some bites, some more active fish in the area, then you break it down. And then um, you have the confidence to, to maybe get that six pound bite. That's really, that's good stuff there, Ben. Uh, and that's kind of what I did at Apopka too. Like the, yeah. the brush pile I had that I caught that I caught almost, I caught my whole limit in day one of the tournament and I caught three of them the second day of the tournament. And it, I caught like 10% of the fish that were in it. Um, it was the craziest shit I've ever seen in my life. But um, yeah, in practice, I went in there and I caught like a two pounder and a, another two pounder and I could see the fish loaded on. I didn't know if they were crappie or bass or what, but I figured they were big. And then I went back later in the, the practice and I would fished it and I broke something off on a drop shot, but it was kind of just like a fluky, you know, I, I, of mm-hmm. course I got sheared off, but it could have been a pound and a half or that pulled right. Cause it was in the, the muck. It was in the middle of it. And then I caught a six pounder on a glide bait right there. That was way off fringe on the side of it that I had to like hit in the face with my glide bait. I had to get it closer to get it to react in about any fish I ever caught. But I didn't know that I was, I didn't know that there was, you know, the fish to win the tournament were in one brush pile but I kind of just kept in my head, you know, I've had a terrible practice besides down on Apopka and um, I'm just going to go maximize that area. And that's, that's just the mindset I'll roll with the rest of the year after that. Uh, longest run you made all year. St. Lawrence. You know, I mean the, and I don't know how long that was. Uh, well, I ran around a bunch once I got down there too. So I ended up running like 240 miles probably that day. Wow. first day but um yeah i'll probably run that far next year every and you day. almost didn't come in with a limit on the first day no Dude, there was a lot of days where i caught five or six keepers there yeah. was a handful of those days uh so. shortest run like did you ever have any derbies where you just like hung around and caught release fish and stayed right around the ramp and just no nope. milled about didn't have any you- of those really guess, not my style i suppose i kind of try to stay away from the launch ramps because i I, I did actually, I started day two at Ufala, Oklahoma, um, kind of around the corner from the bank where everyone started or 65 boats started, but that was probably my shortest run to start the day. But Had I you ever seen anything like that in your life? No, it was nuts. I asked, uh, I actually talked to Austin Cranford at the, the lock the other day about, I was talking about you and about Ufala, saying bad things about you, of course. But um, he's like, I was like, is that the way that's the worst lake in the country? Everyone just fishes right there and catches them. He's like, no, it's usually like red clay right there. It looks terrible. And that made a little more sense to me why everyone, why 65 boats were in a mile and a half stretch of bank. It was, it was absolutely insane. Uh, Percent of fish that you weighed in that you saw on live scope before you caught them the entire year. Uh It's, it's tough because, like, I throw in a brush pile that I see a bunch of fish at. I'm not really targeting a fish. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, if I throw a big worm into a brush pile that I see some dots around, it's not like I caught that fish. But... That's not scoping him. I'm talking, like, okay. cutting it down going, that that's the one that I want to catch. Maybe 30 or 40%? 30 maybe? How about that, folks? So, I mean, same with you, follow. I didn't see yeah. a single fish that I caught there. I was grinding a crankbait into the hard bottom rocky crap. I saw that there was fish in the area, but yep. Uh, fellow open angler that you were most impressed with throughout the I year that you got to know. Yeah. I don't yep. know him at all. Yeah, I talked to Trey quite a bit throughout the year. After I squeaked out a win and – everything at Toledo Bend and he was pretty bummed because he freaking crushed him. And somehow I, you know, just had such a dominant event that that three days was pretty magical. I mean, he won, he, he was 10 pounds ahead of third place or more. So that was, he was really bummed. And I, I mean, ever since then I've been talking to him quite a bit and yeah, I feel pretty bad for him. He had a really tough year after that. He barely, barely did anything after Toledo Bend. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right. It just goes out and catches them. Uh, here's the number of number of offshore altercations throughout the year. <laughs> <laughs> altercations um, yeah. or disagreements? Um, just the one at Harris Chain, really. All right. Yep. First, are you con- uh, are you concerned about that at all? 
What's that? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going on oh, that. So the second day you follow when I pulled up and Gary Klaus was on where I was. I had a, I, I mean, like I kind of talked about it, I think, after that in, in our podcast. But, yeah. You know, you, you catch all your fish, day one in one spot, you pull up and Gary Klaus, you know, veteran elite series angler, boat company owner. <laughs> Owns Phoenix. Uh, Oh, I mean, not old, but like distinguished. A, He's very distinguished. Distinguished and um, intimidating is sitting on the spot, and you're just like, "Hey, uh, Mr. Klaus, uh, I caught all my fish here yesterday. Could could I come fish next to you?" And he, he was just like, "What place are you in?" I was like, "Uh, I think like 18th. All right, come on in here." And so we fished it together. And I mean, there was more of those situations too. So it, it was really not too bad. Uh, are you, how do you think the elite series guys are going to take this? You come with your camera crew, you come with your MFers who are going to follow you on the water. I mean, it is a no back down, no holes barred. You know, a bunch of these guys, you don't know a bunch of these guys. Do you think that's going to be an interesting learning curve going into the the 24 season because i mean let's face it you have a target on your back because you got a lot of guys who have worked their entire lives to get where they're at and to gain their following and here you come you fish nine tournaments you shoot youtube videos and you've got probably one of the top five biggest followings on the elite series already and you haven't even made a cast yeah i mean i don't know i got a ton of respect for all those guys mm -hmm. um i don't know how they're gonna receive it everyone seems extremely professional for the most part on the elite series like to the t um all the guys that i talk to and hang with anyways so it doesn't sound like it'll even be a, a thing or make a blip on their radar but yeah i mean i'm not i'm not intimidated by anyone at this point after fishing the opens and i'm not going to take shit from anyone either so if they want to start something i'm not going to just take it and leave that's for sure are you bringing the camera crew the whole nine yards? Have you even thought about that? I know we're only two days in, but is this going to be uh, all hands on deck? What are we going to be able to see next year on the Elite? Let's start with this. Have you actually, in an interview, announced 100% that you are fishing the Elites next year? Oh, no, dude. I'm going over trying to qualify for the Bass Pro Tour next year. Oh, we can get into that in like the next segment if you want to. Don't get me sure. started. I got dude, the press got release right here. I got like 14 more whiskeys right here, bottles. Of okay. It, so we got a whole long night of it. But but you are um, in, right? Like, have you yeah. officially made that announcement? Yeah, I, mean, I haven't officially made it. But yeah, I'll be fishing it for sure, man. This okay. is a, such a dream of mine. It's unbelievable. Um, it's why I fish this circuit and not not the mlf and not the npfl which i also respect but um yeah i'll, I'll be fishing i'm not gonna it's not gonna be like oh i'm taking it to the next level having seven <laughs> camera boats follow me around like dude that's not my deal i don't wear a jersey i think it's i think it's ironic and funny that i wear a jersey that has aerial font 402 on it i don't wrap my boat like it, it it's it's like i'm not are I'm you not sticking with the 402 next year on the jersey Hell yeah, absolutely. But I'm, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not flashy. I'm not about that. If I never made, if I didn't film any videos this year, I'd be fine with that. Like I would feel bad that people like wanted to follow the journey and I didn't give it to them, but yeah. I don't care about, like I could quit that right now and be fine. Like I don't, I do not care about that. I want to catch bass and be a professional bass fisherman. That's why like I'm, I'm talking about getting burned out being depressed and feeling like I had more to give before I announced that I was doing this. Like, I mean, this, this is my lifelong, my lifelong dream. And uh, yeah, I'm going to document, I'm going to film it. I don't know what, to, to what capacity I'm going to do that, but um, it's definitely not going to be anything gaudy or unrealistic. It's going to be raw and it's going to be myself. And the schedule actually sets up fairly well as a mixture of some new ones, but also some that, I mean, you've already got to be looking forward to a number starting with the freaking Harris chain. Yeah. I mean, the, all of them really starting at Toledo mm -hmm. Bend this year. The The schedule was the best, the best schedule I've ever seen for how I feel about it for the elite series. And honestly, I mean, it's it's kind of sad to say this. When I saw the open schedule, I was actually out fishing, filming content. When they released the open schedule for next year, um, I was almost in tears. I thought it was such a terrible schedule, and it was put together so poorly. And whether that be for myself or just the way it was put, put together, um, 
both, but the Elite Series schedule, uh, and it was almost because the Elite Series schedule, it, I, I loved it so much. Oh my I mean, gosh, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. I got it pulled up. Starting in, in Texas for two events, obviously, you know, many Louisiana, but it's on border Texas. But um, that's a, a phenomenal time to hit both fisheries. Um, and then fishing the Harris Chain in St. John's this year. Well, what about Fork? Spawn, what about Fork in February? Go, not having to go deal with the freaking bed fishing and the, all the history of all the, the January and February Florida events, not having to, to do that. Uh, and then we go to Murray, which is a scoper's dream. This last year, one of the best fisheries in the country, one of the hottest fisheries in the country. Wheeler's probably going to suck, but I know it at least. Smith Lake is the one I circled that um, I need to learn the most about and figure that out. Um, and then, of course, you know, Champlain and St. Lawrence. I, I went to Champlain for four or five days after we fished St. Lawrence, and I went to St. Lawrence after that. I'm, I'm excited for the schedule big time. Yeah, it, that should be in your wheelhouse to where you're not lost on any of those fisheries. Well, not what that you a, what, were lost you on think? any of the new fisheries. What uh, what did you think about the open schedule for next year? Are you going to for sure fish them? or? Yeah, yeah, I like the open schedule for next year. I do like um, – it's a no-win situation for bass when it comes to the opens. How do you do the qualifying? You're going to upset the guys who want to fish three – you got the guys who want to fish nine. You've got guys all over the country. I mean, it's a national elite series travel schedule and lakes with very little payout. I mean, you're one of the 0.5% that made money on it. But I do like that they gave the Midwest. It's due after so many years. Uh, it's not easy with the permitting and the lakes and the fisheries to go up into Minnesota. I like that they made a concerted effort, did a lot of research on that to come up with a, the lake in Minnesota. St. Clair hasn't been on the open schedule in a long time. And obviously the Mississippi river, uh, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, there's some real challenging fisheries on there. I mean, Okeechobee's going to fish really small. Santee, uh, is no very back dangerous. to backs. Yeah, no back to backs. It's going to fish small. We got to go to South Carolina to start the year and to end the year. Uh, across the country, man. That's what it, I It is. About it. But, but I mean, dude, for I a guy from it. Oklahoma, I mean, it's 12, 14 hours up north. I've got Eufaula. I've got uh, the Arkansas, Washita and Arkansas is badass in February. That's like a cool one that no one saw coming. Like I, I'm cool with it. I mean, I like it, but I mean, I'm also a guy that doesn't want to see a lot of nasty rivers and tidal fisheries and stuff on the schedule. So, yeah, I mean, and then know. to end it on Hartwell, I'm, uh, you know, the Bass Nation Championships going on right there, and I'm like, I can hardly even like look at that coverage because it, I, I want to be there so bad for that. Like you know those tournaments where you're just like, oh, I want to be. I love Hartwell in the fall. My favorite fishery, favorite time of the year. Gotcha. So no, I'm looking forward to it. Uh. I mean, I guess you're 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 in this now. Do you want to talk? You want to? Do you have thoughts on MLF, the professional bass fishing world at all? You want to take some questions from the fans? And we got over 800 people on live here. If we take our final break, you want to take some questions and say some controversial sure. stuff? Yeah, let's let's take some questions. That sounds great. I don't have anything crazy to say about the MLF. That's not really my place to say it. I'm not yeah. afraid to say anything about it. And I, not afraid to share what I think is happening. And it's what I think a lot of people think and know is happening. But I think you got through the opens at the right time is what I think then. I think so too. That's for sure. Because I think there's going to be about 75% of that field in the next year. We'll see. All right. We're going to take our final break of the show. When we come back, uh, get your questions in. I'll be scrolling through them on the, uh, on the feedback and the comment uh, for Ben Milliken uh, BTL on a Wednesday night. We'll be back right after this. Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out for yourself. 
I'm the kind of guy that never leaves a house without a pocket knife, and Gamagatsu's come out with the EDC series of knives. EDC stands for everyday carry, so whether you're on the water or off, you can always have it with you. The best thing about it to me is that assisted open feature. With this D2 blade, you've got it right here at your fingertips, so if you can't find your scissors, you need to cut a knot, you need to cut your braid, you've always got it. Make sure you check it out. Never leave home without your Gamagatsu EDC knife. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing. From household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. Are you looking to install your own fishing electronics? The solution is the Bass Tank Power Harness. It takes the guesswork out of installation. No more voltage issues or interference. Designed by an engineer so that you can get professional results right there in your own garage. Installation done right with the help of the Bass Tank Power Harness. You can feel confident knowing that your installation was done right. The Bass Tank Power Harness. Give us a call or order yours today at thebasstank.com. Get the best patterns backed by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the Deep Dive app today. Get that beast right there. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision-making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting beatdownoutdoors.com. All right, we are back, Ben Milliken. How are you not exhausted? Did you do all the driving too, towing after? I mean, you fish, you have the mental exhaustion from that, then you go to Di Disneyland or World. I don't know the difference. I've never been to either. Yeah, World is down in uh, Orlando is where we went to. But, is it uh, cool or is it like, ah, people? It's the most people-y place I've ever been in my life. Oh, I would on not a, like on that. On a Monday in October. But it's, it was like the third time I've been there, and I'm, it's, it's incredible. It's really impressive, but, oh, man, it is people-y. I would not like that. I'm not a, 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 a against what popular opinion is. I'm not a people person. It was like the Bassmaster Classic Expo. Oh, yeah, no, I'm but not. But it's miles of it. It's insane. So are you able to do anything, or you just, like, stand there and wait for a corn dog for an hour? I mean, you literally can't like go on any of the good rides unless you like book it a couple days in advance. Otherwise, it's like a two and a half hour wait for like a decent ride. But luckily, I mean, we have a three year old and a four month old. And so it's <laughs> like you go to the lamest stuff possible. And they love it. It's whatever. They love it. Think it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, we got the questions lined up. Hey, I do want to mention to uh, everybody who are running that. I run the Bass Tank commercial. I had Scott Palmer in studio last week. Uh, you mentioned the electronics. Scott is kind of rebranding the Bass Tank. They've been known for like installs and all that. But Scott came out with the Bass Tank Academy. Uh, I love when I have him on the show. I don't know if you've ever seen any of his BTLs. He nerds out like way beyond my level of expertise. But kind of as a result of that and some of the feedback that he's gotten, he was like, hey, you know, he's an engineer. He knows how stuff works. So he's come out with the Bass Tank Academy, which actually is a library of videos and all sorts of how to things like that. So that link is in the description. So if you have any questions about these electronics, boat installation, wiring, anything, just click on the link in uh, in the bio for this show on YouTube, uh, and check that out. Also, uh, any of the baits, anything, uh, you have is six cent stuff at Omnia. It is. Yes. Yeah. They're in Omnia too. Yep. Uh, any of the stuff you want to do, check out Omnia, big supporter of the show. Just went to Omnia last week, got to see their headquarters. Really cool. The way they have that warehouse and their kind of filming studio and everybody in house there, they're making a big push into the industry. So if you're a first time, uh, Omnia, user go to omniafishing.com use code uh btl23 and get 15 off 
uh, your first order over there on regularly priced items. All right, you ready to take some questions, Ben? Let's do it. All right. Uh, I haven't even read that. Holy cow, this is going to get crazy. Let's do it. Uh, let me... What is this? Is this a bad one? Would you rather have Ozzy hitting fingers for the Astros or winning elite tournaments? Oh, that's John. That's my, my boy that we stayed at. Uh, we stayed at his parents' place up at St. Lawrence River. I think he meant dingers. That was autocorrect. Okay. Um, hitting dingers would, for the Astros. I'd say Ozzy hitting dingers for the Astros for sure. Are they playing right now? They They're are, playing the. Yeah. Ra- Did you really miss an Astros Rangers championship you, game to do BTL tonight? I'm, I'm like a, a bandwagon fan. We just moved down here. We do love the Astros, though. Man, we never had a professional sports franchise since I'm from Nebraska. So we've, yeah. we've really been following them close. But yeah, so you should feel pretty special, Matt. Uh, <laughs> Peter, Peter Long with an interesting dude. That thing's been popping up all over again. Will we see you in an Orkin jersey next year? And is there a chance? I'm going to add on a second to this. Is there a chance that we will see a major non endemic as part of the Ben Milliken brand in 2024 on the Elite Series? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I'll, I'll just try to keep it interesting and say, sure, it's possible, maybe, but but no. Uh, Lucas wants to know, does, does Ben have a boat sponsor? I know you run a Camus by choice, but I also know most elite series guys have a boat sponsor. Well, I wouldn't say most do. I don't know if that's true. Um, but, uh, I don't have a boat sponsor. I, I was working with Boatworks um, out, out of Missouri. So I, they had a couple different boat brands. Camus is what, what they wanted me to promote. And that's what I run the last two years. Will you consider wrapping your boat with and big sponsors next season? I mean, even if the money was right, no. Ooh, the boat question's coming up. Here's another one. What boat will you be running in the Elite Series next season? Here's another one. Ben, are you going to run the same model of boat? And what's your favorite way to rig the panorama? A lot of boat questions running around. Dang, it's crazy when people are curious about that. I might have mm-hmm. had a, a little conversation with Matt about that earlier today. So who knows? We'll see what happens. Uh, favorite way to rig the panorama? Probably the 9-inch version on a 12 odd beast hook with the uh, Three quarter. No, that one's a half ounce weight on that beast hook. Uh, question for Ben and the co-anglers he paired with in the opens. What successful techniques did you see a co-angler deploy tournament after tournament? That's a great question. None, none except the one dude I fished with at Lake of the Ozarks um, through a Carol. Uh, yeah, it was a Carolina rig with a watermelon seed brush hog, and he caught a few fish behind me on that. You didn't have anyone stick them behind you. No. Huh. Uh, oh, great question here. Obviously, uh, let's just keep setting records. Ben's uh, Bass Fishing Hall of Fame trip. Have you called that guy yet? I told him it'd be after this week. I When I sent him an email, yeah. it's like, Ben's fishing in the open. He's got a lot of stuff going on. He'll get with you next week. We've been in touch via Messenger on, on, on Facebook. I think okay, is. awesome. Uh, yeah. Someone paid over $15,000 no. for a day on the water with Ben to support the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Highest auction uh, silent, uh, highest online auction item that there's ever been for that. So when will the video be released for the 15 K trip? That some MF or which if you're a BTL fan, MF or stands for Millican fishing fan. Pay That's right. During the auction. That's right. Now uh, we, we haven't planned anything, uh, and set a day yet. So it's going to be a little bit still, but we need okay. the fishing to get a little bit better before we plan anything too. I'm not going to just go take them out in the backyard and rip <laughs> some fall fish here. Uh, what graphs will you be running next year and why? I can't tell you that right now. I don't know. It's going to be whatever gives me the best chance. I do not care about brand at all other than as long as my forward facing is Garmin. Will you be networking with any travel partners? Uh, gosh, come on guys. He qualified like yesterday for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I no, I don't, I don't really plan to, I think our plan, uh, it's, it's, uh, we had a lot of work to do on it, but I think we're going to buy a big camper and uh, another tow vehicle and, and, and me and Becky and the kids are going to, Roll around with a camper in a boat. All right. When does the next whiskey run come out? We're hoping for Christmas time. Before Christmas, probably Thanksgiving time, Black Friday-ish time. Uh, With big spots or something. Let me see this one. What's this one? What do the organizations have to do in order to secure real paychecks for all these guys so they aren't just fishing for each other's money. Oh, you're a professional angler. Now you get it. You have like a, a seat at the table on this discussion, Ben. You want to dive I mean, into that? What are your thoughts on right off the hopper? Well, I mean, did you, you, were you ex- 
surprised at how much money it costs to fish the opens for a year? Yeah, it, it really is a lot. I, I definitely didn't cut corners with any expenses, so that didn't help. You know, having to travel with the camera guy and the dogs and the family and everything. <laughs> it's not like you can be like, well, screw it. We're sleeping in the truck tonight. You had um, to be 50 grand in, dude. Maybe, man. It is a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's that's a question that has a lot of layers to it. It, it starts with, you know, what's happening with it. I mean, what's pretty obvious is happening with the MLF um, isn't good for anything because it, as much respect as I have for Bass as an organization, I don't think the payouts are as good as they should be just simply with inflation. And I understand they can't just give free money to people. They have to make money too. But if all of the demand is to fish bass now, then they can do whatever they want to and people are still going to show up. So why would they pay out $200,000 for first place or 500,000 or bump the classic back up if every single person wants to fish it and we'll dump $50,000 to go fish the opens and get their teeth kicked in um, and not make any money doing the opens to even qualify. So, I mean, the simple answer is Bass needs to employ more people to go reach out to non-endemics that have more money that can bring more money into the sport because the fishing industry is only so big and only has so much money. And I mean, it's not going to do a bait company a ton of good to go dump 200 grand into the elite series to get a a logo and a couple commercials, but it's not that simple. Um, We have a huge supply and demand issue right now, which is about to get absolutely nutty the next couple of years. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, that's what I said. What's your opinion on the info deal you have teased, please? All right. You fish this thing for a year. Uh, you know what the info rule is. You can basically do whatever you want up until you, except you can't be on the water for 30 days. You can basically get info any way you want. Purchase, barter, trade, anything up until the official start of practice. You've done it for a year. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it needs to change for next year? How did you utilize that information? What are your thoughts on how other people utilized it? I got to ask one of the info questions or else I'll get murdered on here. Like for the opens, you mean, right? Yeah. For the opens exclusively for the opens. Um, I think it's not possible to have a no info rule because it's not possible to police it with lie detector tests. And, and that goes back to not have, I mean, it costs a lot of money to have those people on mm-hmm. site and it takes a lot of time to take individual anglers over and over and over and have the top 50 anglers or anyone that gets a check do it. It's, it wouldn't be feasible, unfortunately. Yep. Um, but there's other changes I think that need to be made with, I think practice needs to be shorter. And when I said that, I think practice needs to be the same as the elite series to help with the fishing pressure on the the bodies of water leading up to the events. It's better than guys that were camping out there for three weeks before the tournaments Mm -hmm. previously. Um, But then I see this side of like Jamie Bruce, but that's a pretty, I mean, that's that's a unique situation where he's like, well, if I had three days of practice, I wouldn't have been able to be competitive because everyone else coming from. Yeah, Frickin everyone UConn. else would have pre-practiced, and I wouldn't have been able to afford to do that as a working man, and I get that too. But I don't think you're going to be able to police the info. Um, it sucks because you, it's literally a different rule. It's a completely different ball game where you can qualify and you're getting the info, but once you're there, you can't get any. So it does suck that it's like it's like – that's, I mean, it's like if we went from an every fish counts format in the opens to five bass limit in the elite series, it's totally different rules, but I don't know how you police it. I, I don't know how it's possible to police it. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine if there was a tournament trail that went from every fish counts to five fish and then went back to every fish counts? That'd just be nutty. Dude, that would uh, be possible. All right. Uh, Zach Willis wants, uh, Ben, my daughter wants you to say daggum stud. Yeah. Well, we need Zark to say that. That's kind of his deal, but that's daggum stud. All right. Let me get to some of these newer comments down here. I'm going to need some more whiskey. <laughs> uh, will you still wear the Kobe jersey on the Elites? Yeah, for sure. This one, that you had to have your uh, a Bass logo when you were on FS1 on live. So I, yeah. I did I did the old Matt Pangrack safety pan over the Kobe jersey. Dude, I, I love that thing. Hey, here's what I'll do. I know like, you've had a long night. We'll go a couple more questions, and then uh, and then I'll let you go. We're already an hour and 20 minutes in. I, 
and you got two young kids and you I had to go feed the baby, fun. Matt. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, here's a good one. What advice would you give to someone who wants to give the EQs a shot for the first time? Austin would like to know that. That's a broad question. Um, I would say make sure that you are ready to lose <laughs> a lot of money in tournaments because you – I, I just feel like you need to have so much experience and knowledge to even have a sh and, and just to even have a shot. So you better be damn good at whatever level is not far from the opens to even consider it. Because it's not fun for people that are getting 30th place at tournaments. It's not enjoyable. It's not great. I mean, you love to fish, you love to compete, but if you're not in the hunt to 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 make the elite series, or if it's not a, a way that you're compensated as your job, then and there's very few people like that where they're making money through, I mean, like you for podcasts and being successful and cashing checks, uh, or making money from sponsors, mm -hmm. um, or being in the top ten. Like there is very Uh oh, we lost his audio. He's gonna have to log back out and log back in. Yeah, audio. Just log back out, log back in, Ben. Log back out, log back in. Here, I'll text him. We still have a couple more ads we can run. Let me run a couple more ads and we'll be back then. Uh oh, you back? Nope. Can't hear him. All right, we're gonna finish. Uh, we're gonna take our final break because I forgot to run a couple ads. We'll have Ben uh, log back out and log back in, uh, and then we'll take a couple more questions and wrap things up. Uh, BTL on a Wednesday night. The great thing about the new Sensation Soft Plastics from Big Bite Baits: heavily scented, super soft, buoyant. Comes in seven great new shapes. I've got a couple of them of my signature series: the Cliffhanger Worm and the Ramtail Craw. Great for a flipping jig, football jig, swim jig, all that. Several other great shapes. Really excited about it. We've worked over the last year. Catches fish all over the country. And I think it's going to catch fish for people everywhere you try it. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat. So you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors including Pearl Shad which has this bleached out white look but it's got this pearlescent really really pretty we've got copper shad which looks amazing in the water it's got that purple flake on the back really really pops in the water and then if you want some real pop we've got sparkle shad nothing but sparkles all over this thing and then last but not least we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md all right we're back let's bring ben back in there you go happened. you're back no here. it's all good man here i am you broke you broke the internet again Apparently. uh no, you you were wrapping up that last question. Anything else you wanted to wanted to add to that? I mean, I, I... I just I don't mean to sound cynical with my answer, but I think yeah. you just mentally that you got to prepare yourself for uh, <laughs> spending a lot of money and probably not getting a lot of financial return out of it, and probably not getting a lot of success out of it either, because uh, it's it's going to be it's just going to keep getting more difficult. I think, especially with what is happening. Uh, what was the bait of the year for you? You had to pick one. Um, probably the seven inch shaky worm from six cents and blood apple that I free rigged. I caught really key fish on that at like four tournaments. All right. Uh, kind of along those lines, Andrew would like to know if you're willing late at night, you're a couple whiskeys in. You willing to give up some juice on some six cents bait releases coming up? Ooh, I don't, I don't know about any, anything I can talk about. I do know we have fifty four <laughs> baits coming out in twenty twenty four. Fifty four. What? Baits. Yep. 
Holy cow. I mean, you've got to have to have a sixth sense wrap next year, aren't you? Because you have to have a wrap on the elite series. I think you either, I mean, that seems like the logical, the ballsy one would, would be to have a red wrap with the 402 on the side. Yeah. I mean, I don't need to put a company on the side of it. I'm going to sell product by catching fish on it. Are you going to go with a 402 wrap? We'll see what we end up doing. You're doing a 402 wrap, aren't you? <laughs> it's going to be cherry red with white 402 and aerial font. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> I like it. Uh, we'll just wrap things up. Uh, your overall thoughts on you're a fan of the sport. You're a student of the sport. Uh, your overall thought on professional bass fishing as a whole right now. There are 184 guys who do this at the very top level. You are now one of them. This encompasses the news that MLF came out with this encompasses the health of the elite series, just kind of your state of the industry, according to Ben Milliken. And we'll wrap things up after that. It's tough um, because of all the change the last five years, just constant change. It hasn't stopped changing for the better or worse. We, I feel like we kept saying the last two years that, you know, bass fishing is never going to go to the next level unless we all are competing under one umbrella and everyone needs to come together. And we need to have one league if we want to be the next NASCAR or golf or PGA or I mean, not, that, not that they've split up. But, um, <laughs> but now that it might be happening, I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing either with – the sport growing and thousands of new college and high school anglers wanting to take the next step. We got to have more grassroots BFL style leagues too, without having 700 boat high school and college tournaments. So I think we're in the, a weird place in time with our sport where there's a ton of anglers that are willing to spend a ridiculous amount of money. And there is not a lot of companies sponsorship wise that are willing to dump very much money at all into the sport and the organizations now seem to be holding on to that money more than ever couple that with rising gas prices lodging inflation and we're in a very weird space where more than ever you need to make your money outside of fishing if you want to make a living <laughs> as a professional fisherman well said. Anything else you want to get in here before we take her out? That's all I got, man. I appreciate it. I've had a good time all year. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to step on here. Um, it was. I remember the first time you asked me to come on Bass Talk Live, and it was a surreal moment to be able to even be on a podcast next to the Mike Iaconellis and, and Swindles and these big names in the industry. And now being able to do it all nine tournaments was awesome, man. I don't think it could have gone any better. It was the smartest thing I did at the beginning of the year. Cause I had some people that were like, dude, we're not going to want to hear from this guy nine <sighs> times a year. He's like the YouTube guy. Like, I mean, it's cool. Like, yeah, let's have him on. But after every tournament really. And I was like, yeah, I think it's going to play. And it played. <laughs> <laughs> it works, man. I, and Thanks for making me look smart, it. Ben. I appreciate it. <laughs> we definitely had somewhere. It was just like, well, shit. We I know we even got far. through like a, we got through a controversy at Wheeler. We got through the beginning of the year, the end of the year, and it worked out. So I greatly appreciate it. Like I said, I know your time is valuable. Thank you for jumping on BTL. Hopefully, uh, we're not going to do it after every tournament next year, but hopefully uh, you'll be willing to jump on BTL again uh, as uh, as you tackle your Elite Series career. For sure, man. I, I can't wait for it, and it's going to be a fun off season. All right. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. All right, there you go. The one and only Ben Milliken, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro. I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in tonight. Like I said, uh, there's a bunch of links in the description in the bio if you guys want to check out what's going on at the Bass Inc. Academy. Okay, here's a cool thing. If you want a chance, if you're one of these guys who are considering fishing the Bassmaster Opens next year and you just heard what Ben said about how much it costs and the money and all that, uh, I'm going to tease this because it doesn't drop until tomorrow, but we have an announcement tomorrow that's going to go down on BTL along with all the other wires is uh, in 19, I fished the uh, Toyota series and had not fished a triple a AAA level event. I fished a couple of bass nation championships. And the only reason I was able to do that was because AFCO ran a deal called the bass Boot Camp, 
gave me some money, paid for all my entry fees, uh, and got me into that level. Uh, and it was kind of when AFCO Freshwater was getting into it. They've got you know the 10% pledge where 10% goes back to conservation, the AFCO bank, bank bags. These guys really care about uh, the anglers, the environment, and the people that are in it. Well, anyway, long story short, there's going to be an announcement of something tomorrow that if you are like, man, I don't have that sponsorship money, but I think I've got the talent. I want to get into the opens. I've got the personality. I know how to film stuff. You might want to tune into BTL at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Also, if you're also in the Bassmaster Open, some uh, some really cool contingency programs uh, that are coming out that you can earn thousands of dollars in each Bassmaster Open event next year. So tune in. That's why we had day four with Frank Scalish on a Wednesday because all that information drops on October 19th. Massive shout out to Ben Milliken who literally was like, hey, dude, I'm driving 20 hours. I think we can fit it in here. Let's do it late to make sure that I get home uh, at 830 tonight. And then all of the uh, MFers who jumped on BTL tonight. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Shows every Monday through Thursday, 8.30 a.m. Uh, and all the BTL fans uh, who have crossed over, greatly appreciate the support, uh, the feedback, and the comments. So this has been another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, 8.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. Dave Rush from Best on Tour and Casey Shedd will be live from the AFCO headquarters in California. We'll talk to everybody then. Have a good night.